November of 1996, together with a community of 85 people in San Dimas, California. This four-square church, which is a, a Pentecostal church, took a seven-year journey that involved gathering daily at 6 a.m. for prayer and the reading of the church fathers. And this eventually led to them, led them to the doors of the Holy Orthodox Church. Because of his role in this community, Father Michael was ordained, uh, he was known as Scott at the time, known ordained to the Holy Diaconate. On the same day, he was received into the church by His Grace Bishop Joseph of the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese of North America. After continuing his theological studies, and after serving as a deacon in Southern California for seven years, Deacon Michael was then ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 2003 by His Grace Bishop Joseph, and assigned as pastor of the Holy Nativity Orthodox Church in Langley, B.C. Father Michael has been married to Bonnie since 1979. They have three daughters and ten grandchildren. And when, um, <laughs> yeah, when I was inviting Father to join us today, I, I recommended that, or I, I suggested that he might want to uh, uh, come join me, possibly Sunday afternoon. We were looking for an activity for tomorrow afternoon, and I said, well, let's go ice fishing. This is before the weather turned cold as it is. And he informed me that he didn't like ice fishing because he didn't like the cold. At that point, I was really thinking whether or not I should disinvite him. <laughs> but we've since forgiven him for this heresy of not liking ice fishing. And we're glad to have him here with us today. So would you join me in welcoming Father Michael Gillis. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I want to talk to you today about salvation and how salvation is understood in the Orthodox Church. Uh, I'm not going to follow our topics exactly as they're in the book, because once I get going, uh, I pretty much go wherever the juice leads me, so... Uh, I, I prepare a big bag of stuff to say, and then as I start talking, stuff comes out of the bag, and it doesn't always come out in the order I had thought it would. So let's start by talking about what salvation is and what salvation isn't. We live in a culture if it, that if it talks about being saved at all, that maybe in movies uh, where there might be some uh, religious, I'm going to move just a bit so I can see everybody, I'm not looking around the post there as much, uh, it imagines that salvation is something that happens after we die, right? I am, if I am saved, when I die, I go to heaven, as though heaven were a place, right? Because I don't want to go to the other place, right? And this way of thinking about heaven and hell and salvation as destinations that take place after we die is not at all in keeping with the Orthodox tradition. This is not how we conceive salvation. I won't spend too much, it's a completely, if you want this talk, you have to invite me back. We'll talk about heaven and hell and what it is and isn't. But for right now, let's just say that salvation has to do with returning to an original relationship with God. The way God created us to relate to Him, to relate to one another, and to relate to ourselves. This is what salvation is. Salvation is a return to paradise, to Eden. <clears throat> What happens when we die? We continue what we have begun in this life. As many of you have already experienced, perhaps, 
You don't have to die to experience a little bit of hell. There's plenty of bit of hell going on right here in this life. Neither do you have to die to experience a little bit of heaven. Right? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within you. Or, if you want to get real technical, in the Greek, it's among you. It's not merely in my heart, but it's between us in our relationships. How blessed it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. For there, the grace of God comes down like the dew of Hermon, which, by the way, is Hebrew metaphor for snow. So it's an appropriate <laughs> um, <laughs> metaphor for us. Right, just like the snow coming down and covering the mountains or the streets here. Um, so this is what the grace of God does when the brethren dwell together in unity. Heaven is something we begin to experience in this life, or at least we can begin to experience. So salvation is this returning to the way we were made to be. Salvation is not a simple formula. It's not, uh, you know, I'm really bad with microphones because I want to move around, right? Uh, can I just take this and just move around? Okay, thank you. I, I was a university professor for 25 years and uh, was used to students nodding off and, <laughs> and so I would move around the room and talk at them and it would help keep them because they never knew where I would show up. <laughs> Salvation is not, and I really, this is real important, a line that you're going to cross. Today, I'm not saved. Oh, I'm saved now. Right? As, and, and a lot of people imagine that. They imagine salvation is a kind of line. If I, if I can just say the right prayer, or fast the right way, or go to the right service, or find the right elder to be my spiritual father. Right? And then somehow I'll cross that line and be one of the saved ones, right? And until I cross that line, I'm not. No, 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 no. Salvation is about transformation. It's about a journey. It's about going somewhere. You might say, and this is a metaphor that I've used, Salvation is more about direction than location. And this is one of the reasons why we can't judge one another because we don't know where the other one's beginning. Forgive me, I don't remember which father I read this in, but one of the ancient fathers, I think it might have been Gregory of Nyssa, but don't quote me on that. I don't remember where I read this. He, said, he likens it to looking at a, uh, a two hills with a valley far away. And you're far away and you can just see two little dots of people going down the road and up the other side. And from a long distance you can see their relative position on the hill, but you can't see which way they're going, up or down. Right? Because you're too far away. You can see, oh, I can see someone on that hill, but you can't really tell whether they're going up it or down it. And this is how it is in our life. You might be able to look at me and say, wow, he's pretty messed up. <laughs> Father Michael, why did you let this guy talk to us? <clears throat> He's so far down in the valley. And, and you would be correct. 
But what you can't see is whether I'm trying to walk up the hill or down the hill. And so salvation is drawing near to God. Someone can look very pious. Remember last Sunday, the publican and the Pharisee. Someone can look very pious, fast twice a week, give alms, right? do all the right stuff, and be going down the hill, going away from salvation. You can't tell from looking at the outside. Because salvation isn't a line that you cross. Oh, that one's saved because he's on this side. This one's not saved because they're on that side. No, that's not, that's not how the Orthodox Church understands salvation. Salvation is a journey, a direction, a drawing near to God. And the church, uh, holy fathers in the church have used lots of different images or metaphors to talk about this. And I want to share some of those with you today and reflect with you about what they mean and what that might look like in our life. It's an important thing when we talk about uh, metaphors or <clears throat> images. A metaphor is a kind of picture of something. I might not be able to talk about it exactly as it is, but I give a picture, like a parable. <clears throat> right? A parable would be a, 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 way, a, a similar thing to a metaphor. Don't get too technical on me. I've got an English teacher here in the front row. Um, and so, uh, but what our problem with metaphors is, our problem with metaphors is, is that we tend to take a image, a metaphor, and turn it into a mechanism. Right? So, we, we want to avoid that because at the end of the day, salvation is a mystery. How does God save us? We don't know. <laughs> it's a mystery. Does that mean we know absolutely nothing? Oh, no, no, it doesn't mean that. There are parables, allegories, images, types, symbols, all of these things point towards it, but none of them define it or delimit it, right? We can't take the metaphor and turn it into a mechanism. When we do that, we end up creating a very small box and trying to stuff God into it. Right. So let's take a look at some of the metaphors. And I'm going to start with Dorotheos of Gaza. St. Dorotheos of Gaza. St. Dorotheos lived, he died in uh, 565. Uh, St. Dorotheus was a uh, spiritual child of Saints Barsanufius and John. Maybe you are familiar with them. And uh, St. Dorotheos was the founder and head of a very large monastery in, uh, in Gaza. In fact, sometimes he's called St. Dorotheos of Gaza, so in Palestine. I'm Antiochian. Got to start with an Antiochian guy. Uh, I just made that up. I wasn't planning this. <laughs> um, Saint Dorotheos quotes in uh, discourses and sayings of Saint Dorotheos of Gaza here. It's a Cistercian Publications uh, book. It's really good, uh, very easy to read, very well translated. Um, well, well translated 
from a easy to read perspective, it's not a technical translation, but it's easy to read. St. Dorotheus begins by quoting John the Dwarf. Now, you know who John the Dwarf is, right? He was a, 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 a companion of Anthony the Great. Okay. And John the Dwarf says this. He says, I would rather a man acquire a little of each virtue than to be the master of one, as some have done, persisting in it and practicing only that, but neglecting the rest. St. Dorotheos talks about salvation as the building of a house that we are saved as we build a house of virtue, right? Um, the psalmist says, uh, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to build it, right? This, what is this house we're building? This is a house of virtue, right? And this then for St. Dorotheos is the one, he actually does many, this is just one, but it's a big one, one of his overarching images, metaphors of what salvation looks like. And the foundation of this house is faith. Right? We have to start by believing. But let me say something about faith. Some people think that uh, if they have any doubt whatsoever, then they don't have faith. As though faith and doubt were mutually exclusive. You either have faith or you have doubt. But this is not... Again, this is not what you read in the scripture, nor in the New Testament. Faith and doubt are opposites, but they are not mutually exclusive. They both exist in us at the same time. Faith and doubt are more or less, not either or. Faith and doubt are more or less, not either or. Imagine, if you will, a balloon, right? And you have air on the inside of the balloon and air on the outside of the balloon. And the balloon may grow and change, right? And the amount on the inside and the amount on the outside varies as the balloon changes, right? So similarly, it is with faith and doubt. Thomas doubted the resurrection. But eight days later, where's Thomas? He's still hanging out with the disciples. They didn't say to him, oh, you doubter, get out of here. No. In fact, Matthew's gospel says some doubted, not one doubted, some doubted. In John, we find out about Thomas's doubt, but Matthew tells us there were others who doubted too. But doubt doesn't mean you don't have faith. Doubt and faith are wrestling realities within each of us. We all wrestle with doubt and faith. In fact, the only way for faith to become real for us is to sincerely engage our doubts. If we don't, then our faith is like in Santa Claus, like magic, it's just like whatever. It's only as we actually engage our doubts and wrestle with them 
that our faith becomes firm. And so this faith is the foundation of the house of salvation. Right? A faith that we wrestle with. A faith that's sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Faith that sometimes maybe we go through seasons of our life that may last months or years or decades where faith is kind of low or where faith is really strong and we, we can't find a doubt whatsoever. We're absolutely convinced. Yeah. Don't you love it when that happens? feels so good to not notice any doubt within myself. But it doesn't mean it's not there. Right? But, so this faith, this faith that we wrestle with, this faith that we engage is the foundation. And on that foundation are laid stones of virtue. Now, virtue is an important word here because even though the fathers of the church use it quite often, we don't often use it in our conversations with one another because it's kind of fallen out of style in our culture. Seventy years ago, if I said virtue, you would all have a very clear understanding of what I probably meant by that. But nowadays, if I say virtue, it's like, what's that? Right? Do you mean like being good? Well, maybe, yeah, kind of. Virtue, actually our English word virtue, comes from the Latin word for man. To be a true human being. What is it? What does a real human being look like? Ah, that would be a virtuous person. That's what a real human being looks like. And when we think about what a real human being looks like, a virtuous person, we notice certain qualities. And these qualities, St. Dorotheo says, are the, the stones that we lay on this foundation of faith by which we build the house of our salvation. And these stones are, are laid based on the circumstances of our life. We don't wake up in the morning and say, hmm, I think I'm going to work on meekness today. <coughs> no, you wake up in the morning and you're overwhelmed with situations that you have to engage. And those actual situations of our life determine the virtues we work on that day. Patience, kindness, gentleness, Meekness, self-control. These are all from St. Paul's list in Galatians. Book of Galatians. Right? Someone in the Philokalia, um, actually, last time I gave this talk, someone asked me to find this for you. And I decided not to print this because it would be really distraction. But if you go to the Philokalia and you want to look it up, there's about a four and a half page list of virtues, followed about a four and a half page list of vice, vices in like 10 point type. It just goes on and on. So it's not helpful, in my opinion, to enumerate 752 different virtues, right? It's enough for me to say, look, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faith, self-control, etc. Right? That these are the virtues. And how we develop the virtues or how we strive for the virtues has to do with the circumstances of our actual life. And here is the really, 
really good news, right? The gospel is good news. The really good news is you don't have to change a thing about the circumstances of your life in order to be saved. You don't have to become a monk. You don't have to get married. You don't have to get unmarried. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to change your job. You don't have to move somewhere warmer <laughs> or colder. You don't have to do a thing. All you have to do is engage your own life with a little bit of faith. A little bit of faith that God is arranging the circumstances of your life just so that you can develop virtue, kindness. He's going to bring someone in your life that you have to be kind to. You don't want to be kind to that person necessarily. But because you believe in God a little bit, you force yourself to be kind. He's going to bring someone, some circumstances in your life that require patience. You, you don't want to be patient. You don't feel very patient. But because you have a little bit of faith in your life, a little bit of belief that God is present, God is active, you force yourself to be patient. <coughs> right? You may not want to be very meek. Meek, by the way, is a word that, um, it's an old English word that makes absolutely no sense today, right? When was the last time you heard someone say, wow, he's a meek fellow, right? And people just don't say that anymore, so we really don't know what it means. Better translation into modern English, gentle. Jesus, it says, was gentle and lowly. Gentle doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. Gentle doesn't mean you can't say yes or no when you need to say yes or no. Gentle means you're gentle when you do it. Gentle, right? I don't need to blow you out of the water. I don't need to prove how much authority I have or how much power I have or how much whatever, right? Gentle. And God, in his great love for you and his great desire to save you, that is to return you to a original relationship with him and with one another and with yourself is going to bring circumstances into your life that give you an opportunity to be gentle or not right. Saint Dorotheos says that the virtues are habits right when I was a young man, a uh, teenager, I had quite a temper. And I was one of those kids who, like, would put his fist through a wall when he was angry, uh, unless he hit a beam and then he would break his fingers, right? Um, I was the kind of kid who, you know, I was fine, I was fine, but if you pushed me too far, I went berserk, right? And then I just was, ah, any of you, uh, uh, anyway, the rage. And one day, it dawned on me that when I felt that urge of rage, there was a kind of split second where I made a choice, right? I feel this this raw, and the thought comes to me, hit the refrigerator. And so there's a split second where I make a choice. And uh, in those days, I was um, 
This was in the 70s, and uh, I had first encountered Christ in what was then called the uh, Jesus movement. I was a Jesus people. My hair used to, I used to have an afro, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, now I just have an ah. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to have an afro <laughs> and uh, bushy hair, right? And uh, uh, you know, long because those, that was what was happening in those days. And so I didn't, you know, God was very gracious to help me in those days because I didn't know anything. It was just I had this little New Testament and. You know, all my friends who were into, like we used to baptize people in the beach, take them down to the beach and baptize them in the waves. And it was like, it, among everybody in bikinis, like we would all come down and with white robes, right? And there were, people would be laying on the beach in California in their bikinis and whatever else. And we would all march down seeing these, you know, saw, can you imagine that? We were crazy in those days. <laughs> It was probably a good crazy for a teenager of all the crazies you could choose, right? It was probably a good crazy or better than others. So, but I didn't have, I didn't know anything about the church or the fathers or anything, but I just had this thought. I wonder what would happen if at that split second when I feel the rage and the thought occurs to me, I need, I should kick that dog or punch the wall or, you know, throttle the person in front of me, whatever it was, if I just didn't do it, what would happen? What would happen if I just didn't do it? And so, God is so faithful. Lots of opportunities to be angry and full of rage <laughs> come into my life. <laughs> Right? This is God's love for us. He wants to save us. So he gives us lots of opportunity to engage in virtue. Because that will return us to the original image that we've fallen away from. And so somehow by a miracle, the thought, uh, the rage, the thought, and then the thought, I have a choice. And and then I uh, 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 literally, this is what I'm feeling. Like, uh, 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 I just, uh, 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 okay. And at first, nothing happened. The rage is still there. The rage was not dissipated. Oh, oh, uh, and then, and then slowly, the rage started to dissipate, and I didn't break anything, including <laughs> fingers. Right? It began to dissipate. And then it was, oh my goodness. Just because I feel something very, very strongly, any kind of passion, be it anger, lust, depression, right? any kind of strong feeling, doesn't mean I have to act on it in the way the thoughts of my mind present to me. And what I discovered was the next time that happened, and again, God is so faithful, there was soon another opportunity to experience rage. It, I, I felt the rage, I had the thought, I'm going to hit this or kick that or whatever, and then this time even more quickly the thought came. Oh, but I don't have to do that. And sure enough, the rage still was there. It didn't dissipate. And then slowly, it did dissipate. And I didn't break anything. And the more I did that, the more it became a habit. So that what at first felt unnatural to me, right? 
because up to that point, what felt natural was breaking things when I got angry. What at first felt unnatural became natural through the habit of practicing virtue. I've kind of coined a phrase. I haven't really found a good uh, other way to express this. So please bear with me as I use this phrase. I call it holy hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is a bad word. I know, I know. We, we don't like hypocrisy, those bad Pharisees, those hypocrites, right? Except the word translated hypocrite into English, that old word, uh, is really a transliteration of mm -hmm. hypocritos, mm -hmm. which doesn't really mean what we mean by hypocrite today. What it means is something more like a charlatan, right? In the Bible, when it says someone is a hypocrite, it means someone is intentionally deceiving you for their advantage, right? They're pretending to be righteous, but actually they want your money. That's, a, that's the Bible word for hypocrite. But the way we use hypocrite today is more like, well, if I'm, <laughs> you know, have you ever destroyed a friendship this way? Well, I gotta be honest. <laughs> and so you say what you're feeling at the moment and you destroy the relationship. Well, actually, I think your hair is absolutely atrocious. You know, and you need to lose some weight. <laughs> and by the way, where do you buy your clothes? Okay, you know what, just because those thoughts occur to me doesn't mean I need to say them. But you say, well, you're being a hypocrite. If you thought it, shouldn't you say it if you're going to be honest? Correct answer, no. Okay, and we say, oh, but you're being hypocritical. No, you're not. You're being loving. You're being kind. Because all kinds of junk occurs to me. All sorts of thoughts and feelings come and go in my mind. This is why I have the, what the fathers call a reason that can ride over my mind and determine what I should and shouldn't say, what I should and shouldn't do. And so I call this holy hypocrisy. This holy hypocrisy, like patience, right? I can be patient even though I'm not patient, right? I don't feel patient, right? I feel all kinds of things about this situation, but I'm going to do the patient thing. And as I do the patient thing, and it becomes a habit, lo and behold, I become a patient person. Right? And so, St. Dorotheos of Gaza, and he basically is summarizing for us this whole desert tradition of Egypt and Palestine uh, from about the 300s through the, through the 700s until the Muslim conquest. So he's kind of summarizing that for us. One of his key images or key metaphors is this building the house of virtue. There is a clock over there, so I'm going to try to keep track of that. Uh, we wanted to have lunch at what time? Around 12.15. What, what did the coke say? Around 12.15 still? That's fine. Right? Okay. 12.15, 12.30, whenever okay, you're Okay, because I, what I want to do is make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Okay. He says that we're building this house of virtue, the foundation of faith, the bricks are the virtues that we develop as we engage our real life as it is right now. You know, 
When I, was a, when I was young, I was an athlete, I would wake up in the morning, I used to put my shoes and shorts right next to my bed, because I would wake up, and before my eyes were really open, I would be out and I would go for a 10 kilometer run. Like, I did that for years, okay? Now, I wake up, and I feel like I've already run the 10 kilometer. <laughs> It's like the body just doesn't do what it used to do. Or actually, it's the sad thing, it's now doing things it didn't used to do. <laughs> and so God has worked into... Okay. In the book of Genesis, it says that when God created the plants, the seed of the plant would be in the fruit of the tree. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they changed reality. But in that very fruit was the seed of the healing of the brokenness. So, in my sinful, torn up, messed up, mostly confusing life, I'm standing up here like I know what I'm talking about. Don't let that fool you. I am confused about reality most of the time. But I have a little bit of faith. And I, 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 I try to move towards God. And I read holy people whom the church has said, no, you can trust these guys, read them. So I read St. Dorotheo, St. Isaac, St. Maximus. Like I, I'm kind of a, a big reader. My wife, she sometimes, she says, um, you know, most wives are jealous about other women in their husband's <laughs> life. <laughs> I'm jealous of your books. <laughs> Forgive me, honey. And I put the book down and look her in the eyes. And, what, what was it that you were saying? <laughs> this too is salvation. This too is salvation. Right? And so God has, even in our fallen state, the seed of our own salvation is there. So every time I screw up, there is an opportunity to grow in virtue. Humility. We're going to talk about that quite a bit more later on. For example, uh, kindness, meekness, gentleness, right? We're coming into the great fast. Oh, this is something I actually wanted to start by saying this. I told you it would come out all mixed up. <laughs> We're coming into the great fast, and this is a pre-Lenten retreat. It was going to be a Lenten retreat, but I couldn't make that, so it's now a pre-Lenten retreat. Everything I'm going to say today is about how you do Lent. Lent is about returning to salvation. Yes, certainly it has outer aspects. Don't eat that go to this extra church service, right? It has outer things. But the outer aspects of Lent are all about helping us get to the inner work. And that's what our salvation. Fasting is not our salvation. Remember the publican and the Pharisee last week? The Pharisee fasted twice a week. But he, it didn't help him. Right? Why? Because he was judging others and comparing. Instead of just looking at his own life in Christ. Or, well, not in Christ, in Yahweh. He was a Jew, but in those, that relationship with God. So... All these things will help us. The extra church services, uh, the, the repentant tone of all the hymns, the fasting, these are given to us to help us, but help us do what? 
build the house of salvation, which starts on the foundation of faith, built with the stones of virtues. St. Dorothea says, the mortar that holds the stones together is humility, which will come up again later. He says, the stresses, the things that hold the building together. He says, the problem with some of us, St. Dorothea says, is that when we build the house of virtue, we try to just build one wall. I'm really good at this, right? Fasting. Boy, I know all the fasting rules. I can do all the fasting stuff. Are you kidding? I read every single label. I know the technical terms and on when they're not gonna fool me. Wait, that's a milk byproduct, isn't it? Ah, I, you're not gonna eat that. You, you build that one wall of the house and what happens when the wind blows? Because fasting is indeed a very virtue. It's part of self-control, right? But if you just build one wall of the house, as soon as the wind blows, it falls over. We have to remember what John the Dwarf said. Don't focus on just one virtue or one set of virtues. You've got to develop all the virtues. And this is why salvation has to do with all of our life, not just our church life, but our relationships with our friends, our relationship with our enemies, our relationship, I love it, um, Saint uh, uh, Maximus, the confessor in one, his hundred chapters on love in the Philokalia says, um, we must love all human beings equally. Some we love as friends, some we love as enemies, but we love them all, right? And how you love a friend and how you love an enemy may not be exactly the same. Well, it almost certainly isn't, but we love everybody. Or at least that's the virtue we're working on. And all of life will give us opportunities. The trusses, the, we might say nowadays, the rebar, the, the, the thing that holds all these bricks and the walls together, he says, is discernment and discretion. Right? We have to be able to not only discern what is the appropriate in this situation. Right? So, being patient. Right? It is, this is one of the virtues. But you have to discern. Sometimes it is appropriate to speak and say, uh, hello, I've been sitting here for four hours now. Have you forgotten about me? Right? It's good to be patient, but even patience requires discernment. Right? How is patience applied in this particular situation? It also requires discretion. If discernment is knowing what to do in a particular situation, discretion is knowing how to do it. Right? I might determine that it's appropriate for me to uh, say to my uh, my, hu my husband, let's do it from the wife's perspective, uh, you know, you really need to bathe more often. But how I say that is a matter of discretion. Right? That is, there's, you know, there's both sides of that, and it's that discernment and discretion that hold the house of virtues together. It's the stresses or the rebar. The roof, he says, is love. Right? It's the cover of the whole thing. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Right? That's from the first epistle of John. Right? 
that's kind of, that's where we're building to. That's the roof. The roof is love. All right. I'm going to stop there. There's obviously tons more I could say, uh, but I'm going to wait and give us uh, 15 or 20 minutes to ask questions. So 